the Joe Rogan experience. So, well, you know, there is good evidence that lion's mane also uh, compensates in many of these uh, neurogenic benefits. That's all I've stuff does. all the time. This is like a lion's mane elixir that I, I pour. It. Tell me if that shit's any good. Well, it comes from China. And is that bad? Um, every Chinese expert that I've met said I wouldn't dare buy a mushroom from China. Jesus and, um, Christ. So this is we have a spoonable lion's mane. Let's see what you got. And uh, I put that in smoothies all the time, and that's my go-to. And that's what, exactly the research. Can I put it in coffee? Yeah, I put it in coffee. And Jamie, do you, can you pull up that? How much the, should I put in The here? neurogenesis benefits of lion's mane. How much should I put in here? Ooh, it's open. It's yeah. not open yet, right? No, it's, it's how much can I put in there? I'd put a, 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 about a teaspoon. A teaspoon, and then stir it in. About that. But the the neuro yeah, that's good. And the neurogenic the, the this company in France that we did the neurogenic test with found that the mycelium was far more active than the mushroom fruit bodies. And so oh. the lion's mane stimulates uh, neurite outgrowth and basically extends the nerves from. From uh, from growing uh, compared to baseline. Yeah. So in seven to twelve days, a substantial up to twenty two percent increase in neurite uh, outgrowth. What we found was actually there was one was um, at eight percent, one was at twelve percent, and then um, separately we stacked it with an analog of psilocybin. And rather than that, that being the arithmetic arithmetic additive of cumulative, we found a synergy. So we think that lion's mane. The research has shown it increases myelin regeneration on the sheath of the nerves. And the psilocybin proliferates nerve tip growth. So it should conceivably help you learn. This is, so this is an example. This is unexpected result. This is lion's name mycelium uh, that's showing a 14, uh, you know, basically a 14.8% over baseline. Then we have a psilocybin analog that didn't do all that great. Which only, analog is this again? This is a... I'm going to describe the analog for now okay. uh, because for obvious reasons, but it's a legal analog. It creates a 7% uh, outgrowth of neurites. But then we stacked it with lion's mane uh, and, and the uh, psilocybin analog. There's a theoretical additive effect, 114 plus 107, 122. But we got 136. It's statistically significant. The outlier actually is even higher. So the, neuro, neuro, the neuroscientists in France that did this study was ex extremely excited. And we found that and the more we titrated it to greater dilution, the more active it becomes. What's that mean? Well, what Titrate? It, what does that mean? Well, maybe the, we're diluting it. And these are human cells, pluripotent stem cells. And what we found was originally – uh, we were told it's, uh, it's called three micrograms uh, per milligram or three micrograms, a millionth of a gram. Um, but when we went back to, to uh, 0 0.03, 100 times less, the neurogenic benefits became greater. Now, there's something called the PK conversion, the, the pharmacokinetics. When you ingest something, only a, a, a small portion of it may make it into your bloodstream. So, but the good news is, is that these things are so non-toxic and they're so potent. Now, looking at the dosing regimen, it appears so far, we haven't done this clinically, this is human cells in vitro, but this laboratory is predictive of neurogenic compounds um, that these the neurogenic benefits are so substantial uh, that the PK conversion of ingesting them could be seen in the bloodstream um, as a fairly good conversion rate. So you... If, for instance, if you take um, vanillic acid, vanilla, about 2% will make it into your bloodstream. So if you take a one whole gram of vanilla, only 2% actually get, gets in your bloodstream. So that, that's the PK conversion. So what we're seeing is um, right now is the potency of this is so strong at lower and lower dilutions, we're getting more and more potency. So I'm. This is yeah. It's a. It's. A, I like to say dilution is a solution to profitability. The more that we dilute, the more potent it becomes. So this is why the neuroscientists in France are doing the study. Going, this stuff is so potent. Please dilute it. Dilute it. Dilute it. So. Wow. And so we're we see this as a tremendous horizon. Um, that lion's mane's legal. It's an edible and choice mushroom. Thousand year history of use. Um, I, we found that the mycelium is far more potent than the mushrooms. 
for really good reasons. The, the com some of the compounds are called aranacines, and these are actually discovered by Kawagishi in 1994, looking for an antibacterial agent. And so when, they, when he was looking at the mycelium uh, fighting bacteria, he found that the mycelium expressed this antibacterial cyathan derivative, and he gave it the name aranacine after hericium aranaceus, just like penicillin is named after penicillium. And so he stumbled on the fact that it has neurogenic properties and antibacterial properties. So the mycelium is navigating through the ground through a hostile environment. It's only one cell wall thick. It, the mycelium has an immune system that's operational between like 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 35 degrees Celsius. That's, that's, that's the window it's growing in. So its immune system is operative in that window. When you do super hot water extracts, you're in the extreme zone. That's not part of the immunological lifespan of the mushroom. You're decocting it. You're taking out ingredients, but you're not harnessing uh, within the immunological uh, window of temperatures that the mycelium has evolved to fight off pathogens. And so what we have mm. found is the mycelium is far more active than the fruit bodies. This is all new science, but then mushroomreferences.com is populated with dozens upon dozens of peer-reviewed articles showing the mycelium is far more active than the fruit bodies. And um, a whole genome sequencing of reishi, for instance, found 25 more, 25 percent more genes coding for proteins are expressed at the mycelial state than at the mushroom state. Well, it makes sense because the mushrooms at the end of millions of cell divisions over months, years, even decades, finally produce a mushroom that rots in five days. Right. The mushroom doesn't need a good immune system; it's attracting mycovores, animals, deer. Um, you know, John just showed me some photographs of um, he's going to show you. Of, he was in a campground and found deer in the morning digging up mushrooms out of the ground. Well, animals engage John mushrooms. You're, you're one of your colleagues here. Or maybe it's Jeff. I'm sorry. Jeff, one of the guys yeah, who works yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so but the idea, but, but many of mushrooms attract uh, insects, people, animals um, because they're fragrant. Uh, they're protein, they're nutritionally dense, and they want to engage humans. The mycelium is navigating through a microbially hostile environment. And a report came out in the literature of over 1,000 species of bacteria in a single gram. There's more than uh, eight miles of mycelium in a single cubic inch. So the mycelium is navigating through a hostile microbial environment. It's setting up uh, guilds and microbiomes and collections of cooperating bacteria that can help them defend against pathogens. Look at that. Estimated up to eight miles of mycelium in a single inch of soil. And it's only one cell wall thick. That's such a weird looking image. So it's so hard to see what that is. That's a mushroom that's melted back into the ground. It's wow. mycelium that's just, now the mushrooms generate mycelium and it goes underneath the ground. So every time you're walking on the ground, you're walking upon miles upon miles of mycelium and it knows that you're there. It, these are sensitive. These are not only externalized stomachs that are digesting nutrients and externalized lungs, exhaling carbon dioxide, inhaling oxygen, but I believe these are extant uh, neurological networks of nature. When you see that pervasiveness of those cells, and the climate change scientists are coming around to this, 70% of the carbon biologically is stored in mycelium in the ground. The way to fight climate change is not only replanting trees, which is great, I love it, uh, but it's the mycelial networks you're building in the humus that creates the soil, that creates the biodiversity, that then guarantees the health of the ecosystem. So it's the mycelial networks that govern because they're so pervasive. They set up because they're antibacterial properties, they're probacterial properties. Um, another example of this is in the microbiome of soils and inside of humans' stomachs. Uh, turkey tail mushrooms and a placebo-controlled uh, uh, Random, uh, a, a, a randomized clinical study with humans uh, from a some scientist associated with Harvard found that turkey tail mycelium is a prebiotic for the microbiome that feeds a bifidobacterium lact lactobacillus uh, and suppresses clostridium, which is an inflammatory bacterium. So it's really, really interesting that the mycelium is feeding nutrients to the beneficial bacteria within the microbiome that then gives us health. And so uh, it's, it, these are precursor nutrients that elevate 
the populations of the beneficial bacteria. So the two go hand in hand. Now, what about edible mushrooms, things like shiitake and the, the, those type of mushrooms? Is there any nutritional benefit to those things? Uh, enormous nutritional benefit. And there's been two also meta studies that have come out this year um, showing um, that um, the ingestion of, of um of, of mushrooms with elderly people over the age of 60, there's a 50% uh, decrease odds of Alzheimer's-like symptoms with a population of people consuming three mushroom meals per week. Now, they didn't specify the mushrooms. This is not a single pour, um, but the mushrooms they're commonly eating are oyster mushrooms, shiitake, and shimeji, and, may, and maybe some some other mushrooms. But that's that's one meta study that came out. There was a study out of Japan from Dr. Ikikawa at the National Cancer Center that found statistically significant reduction in cancers across the board. I think 162,000 people in this data set. And he was sent over to Nagano Prefecture to look for this. And these are edible and delicious mushrooms. Also, they empower the immune system. Again, signal from the noise, statistically significant reduction in overall cancer rates associated with a food. The division now between, you know, Foods and medicines is blurred, and yet it speaks to Hippocrates in you know, in Dioscorides, stating that let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. So, it's interesting because uh, physicians have been taught, you know, this sort of monomolecular approach to medicine, and now we're realizing that these foods are essential nutrients for your immune system that that uh, downregulates inflammation. It's so interesting that we're learning all this during our lifetime too. So- do you think that would all be established by now? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. We have a paper coming out in the next uh, two or three days, maybe in the next week, and it's on uh, turkey tail mycelium um, the grown on rice, and we were able to find out something that no one had really reported in the literature. The, the traditional Chinese medicine approach is that these are immunomodulators. They help the immune system, but they also are not inflammatory. When you have an immune response, oftentimes associated with an inflammatory response, blood rushes to the wound, you inflame, you have all these, uh, these compounds that are being produced by the blood to, to suppress uh, an infection. But you can overamp the immune system and have an infl- a pro-inflammatory response that can cause a lot of oxidative stress damage uh, collaterally. And so the article that is just coming out with BMC, um, um, uh, Biomed Central, um, uh, Alternative and Complementary Medicine, peer-reviewed, um, we have found that the mycelium, when it grows on rice, bioferments the rice to then produce a unique immunological response that upregulates what's called interleukin 1RA and interleukin 10. These are anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines. And so the mycelium doesn't do that, the mushrooms don't do that, but the mycelium is bio-fermented, the rice uh, like tempeh is, is transformed, or like yogurt comes f- from milk because of, uh, of uh, lactobacillus, or acidophilus, and that transformation then makes a novel product. We've found the same thing, that the the rice compared to the rice control has no anti-inflammatory properties. The mycelium, because of the extracellular metabolites, changes the rice into a unique immunological product that excites the expression of anti-inflammatory compounds while also exciting the pro-immune response. So it's a buffered response. (laughs) 